Dr. Ellen Vora, I am so thrilled to talk to you and to have this conversation. I just have a feeling you and I are just going to talk nonstop because we have the same heart, the same vision, the same kind of thinking when it comes to mental health. And I'm just thrilled to interview you. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. It's nice to be with a kindred spirit. Oh, it is. It is. It's so good. It's so wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, can you, people have heard your incredible bio. You have such an impressive bio. I mean, an English major from Yale and then your medical background and then your move over to the way you've challenged the norm in the biomedical model and the neuroreductionist approach of psychiatry to really look at whole people and the holistic approach. It's just beautiful. It's like what I've been trying to do for 38 years with my research. So that's why I'm so excited to hear you talk about what you do in such an incredible way. So before we start, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself that's not in your bio, you know, a little bit about you, what motivates you, how you got where you are today? Great. Yeah. I think probably what unifies what's not in my bio, but it's really relevant is that I'm in this struggle like everyone. I think that's the only reason I can really do good work with my patients is that I have come up against a lot of the same obstacles and barriers and challenges that the people I'm helping are coming up against. And I think about the fact that like I teach a lot on insomnia. I am a sleep procrastinator, like beyond <laughs> most people. And I, I am basically- Let's talk someone, about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm a night owl, right? Like to me, yeah. I, I love social connection. And the, for why is it that the conversation never really gets good until midnight? Exactly. And I preach, you know, go to bed at 10, but I do until something pulls me in the other direction, which yeah. to me is perfect. It's sort of the advanced college seminar approach to how do we balance doing the right thing for our body and our overall overall well-being with the fact that the goal is not just perfection. The goal is a fulfilling life, you know, and sometimes oh, the that, right trade-off. Yeah. That is brilliant. And I don't mean to interrupt you there, but what you've just said there has just set so many people free because I write lots of books, as I've told, as you know, and I work through the night because I have no disturbances and that's then I'll sleep in in the morning. And I know that's not the ideal pattern, but it works for me. And I'm so glad how you've said that sometimes you, you've got your ideal but there are times in your life where fulfillment will override. So it changes your pattern, that great conversation that goes on all night, which changes just, it compensates for that, what may have happened biologically because you didn't sleep, but that there's another benefit. There's a trade-off that's actually really good. So I'm so glad you raised that point. Yeah. We could talk about that alone quite extensively. It comes exactly. up all the time in life. The, the real work is discernment. It's making the moment to moment choices of what's the act of self-love right mm -hmm. now. You know, is it the 10 PM bedtime? Is it the 4 AM bedtime? <laughs> I can so good. That is so good. Yes, let's definitely dive into that. If not in this conversation, in another. Hopefully this one will start it. And I'm a parent, you know, I have a four and a half year old daughter. And so if nothing like in life kicks you in the face quite like being a parent, I don't know, you know, so I think that I've got I've four really, kids. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. 18 books and four kids. God bless. You know, it's just it's hard and it's survival. And I think that people like me come into parenting very precious. You know, I was sort of like how do people wind up so messy with it? You know, why are the kids eating French fries off the floor of the minivan? I'm just going to have my beautiful <laughs> baby in the carrier. We're going to walk down the street and it's yeah. just going to be blissful and everything will be organic. You know, yeah. it's like, and now I just want to punch my earlier self in the face. You know, <laughs> it's like, and, and I think yeah. that, yeah, the reality is that, you know, parenting, which is like the greatest drug, you know, it's this transcendent experience. It makes everything in life less convenient, but deeper and, and more transcendent. It's really, humbling and so equalizing and just lets you realize there's just spiritual growth in like all the micro moments with kids mm -hmm. that you realize all of your shadow, all of your blockages. It just helps hold up this mega mirror on mm -hmm. where you still need to grow. And so, and then I think with health, I struggle like with health at this point, I'm fairly in balance, but that's after a about a 10 year, very inefficient process of learning. How do I get my body in balance. And this was all part of the crisis that I was in throughout medical school. And a part of residency was, I don't really think I'm, I'm helping my patients thrive. Like I could tell I was helping patch them up in a certain way. People would get on a very elaborate cocktail of psychiatric medications. They'd be patched up to an extent. They wouldn't be as quote unquote symptomatic as they were coming in. But like there was still this gut check of, are they thriving in their life? Like, am I proud of this work? And oftentimes I would actually come to the awareness that, you know, you're always on that delicate balance around do no harm. And I would sometimes really think it 
it was a judgment call whether I truly was doing no harm. And so for me, there was, it was such a crisis mm. and I couldn't get my body healthy, couldn't get myself feeling well, didn't really think I was getting my patients feeling well. And I went on a, a long autodidactic journey of how, mm. you know, looking at other modalities, Eastern modalities, how different disciplines around the world think about health and healing to find an approach that actually made sense to me that actually moved the needle for my patients and for my own struggles. That's incredible. And it really has been a journey. You started off as an English major and then transitioned. Can you tell us just a little bit about that? Because it's such a great story that, you know, you're, you're, how you've got to where you are today and so highly credentialed and so much that you've studied, but you've almost gone full circle, haven't you? Back to ancient medicine. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. yeah. I think I'm a weird combination. I think to make it through medical school, it's helpful to be someone who, you know, it's very hardworking and sort of in a Chinese medicine sense, like somewhat metallic, kind of like, just like sort of you go, you get on a track. It starts freshman year of college when you take general chemistry and then you just keep checking these boxes and it's a never ending path. You know, you take orgo and you take physics and you take math and mm. biology and all these labs and then you take the MCAT and then you apply to medical school and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I am someone who you can put me on a path and I will keep going with inertia, but I'm also pretty radical and, and sort of kind of a weirdo and a questioner and marching to the beat of my own drum. I think those two things don't go hand in hand all that often that you're like, I will jump through every hoop you give me and march to the beat of my own drum. You know, no, I, can that. That. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're kindred spirits. Yeah. And, so. Oh, sure. and so I always felt like I'm different here. And I guess in a way you, you could have saved me a lot of trouble in med school as I was trying to pick my specialty. And I was so tormented by that decision. And I was like, or tortured by the decision. I was thinking, you know, all these different specialties I was considering. And they could have just told me if you were an English major in college, you're going to be a psychiatrist. So like, stop. yeah going around Stop, in circles yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah. It, like in college, you get to this height of what I'm really passionate about are the complexities, the gray areas, the nuances of what it is to be human yeah. on this rock barreling through space with no certainty. And we're sort of here to try to feel fulfilled or connected to purpose mm -hmm. or to experience love or whatever it is, or to show mm -hmm. up in service or shift the whole enterprise from fear yeah. to love. And I think yeah. that I was like really thick in that by the end of college. And then med school mm -hmm. is this sort of like careening to the bottom of a pit where you're back to learning like the cut and dry sciences, mm -hmm. which are cool. Like science at its most extreme is mm -hmm. totally magic. You know? It is. It, <laughs> it is. Very it spiritual. is. Very. Uh, I, told you, I always say science and spirituality are the same thing. They are at the extreme. Yeah. yeah. But learning nephrology in med school is not spirituality. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the tools of the trade kind of thing, <laughs> the basic, basic mechanics. And so I, you know, I, I think that I felt pretty disenchanted. I was like, this is not engaging me. I don't feel as lit up or turned on by this material. So I, I found psychiatry as the place where it's like, okay, at least here we're exploring the depths. We're groping in the dark of the human condition. And that's where I like to be. But then in residency, in my psychiatry residency, it kind of took the mental health or our human condition and turned it into a cut and dry science. These mm -hmm. symptoms equals this diagnosis equals this medication. And as you said, you spent how many years doing that? You didn't, instead of learning about the, the variability of humanity, which you'd learned more as an English major, here you learned to diagnose and attach a label and attach a medication. Yeah, yeah. And, and kind the of meantime, missing the person. <laughs> kind of completely miss the person. missing the person. I remember there was a moment in my, I think I was in my third year of med school. I was in my surgery rotation and we're standing around in the OR. We're doing an appendectomy. So someone yeah. came in with appendicitis. We're mm -hmm. removing the appendix and you're, all, you're kind of just talking while you're doing the surgery. There's like a radio yeah. playing in the background and I'm making small talk, but I'm also like trying to get something out of this experience. And I turn yeah. to the surgeon and I'm like, so why do people get appendicitis? Yeah. To me, that felt like the obvious question. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I thought I was asking too stupid of a question. Yeah. And he, he was like, we don't ask why. <laughs> it's like, oh we cut. Gosh. We don't ask why. And We cut. We don't ask why. That's very shocking. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, all I do is ask why. Like from mm. the minute I wake up in the morning to throughout my dreams at night, it's all why, why? right? It's, yeah. it's making sense of this. It's learning. It's growing from what's coming down the pipeline at us from our experiences. Mm. And with health, especially you look around, like 
we're in so many, you know, we could list the different epidemics we're in. We're in an anxiety yeah. epidemic and insomnia and a loneliness and, you know, we're many others. On and top of the obvious, a, yeah. A pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I feel like why is, is our path forward? You know, it's like, how do we move out of this? Why did it come to be? What can we do differently going forward? And so to me, like actual progress is all about why is understanding the roots and the underpinnings of why things are out of balance. Mm. Oh, that's incredible. You know, for 38 years, I've done cognitive neuroscientific work around the human condition and worked in Africa and worked, that's where I grew up and worked with the work for all across everything from learning disabilities, dementias, traumatic, and just trying to understand the science of thought and how minds work and the depth of the human condition. And I even went after my initial phase of research, I did this, okay, I'm not going to do lab work. I'm going to actually work with humans and actually try and understand what this thing means and then came back and did more formal clinical trials and whatever. But the whole thing was, as you say, to try and understand and ask the question, why do people do what they do? And the big conclusion at the end of the day is you just never stop asking those questions. And so everything I've developed has been based around become aware, self-regulate and find out why and then reconceptualize, embrace process and reconceptualize. And I say all that to say that I didn't mean to go on about that. I just wanted to say that to say that I hear what you're saying. I hear that we've got to keep asking those questions. Otherwise, we will become dry and clinical and forget all about the human and the human experience. And, you know, if you're dealing with psychiatry, you're dealing with a human, every medicine, if you that amp- appendectomy, you're still dealing with a human. Why did they get, what did happen to cause that, you know? So. In the context of their whole life, you know, and I yeah. think about that, I mean, certainly with mental health, it, to me, it's, it's an obvious approach is to take a holistic approach to think it's not just what is your genetic chemical imbalance and what pill corrects that to me, even if that is, you know, on some level getting at some truth Mm -hmm. in mental health. And I, I continue to sort of question that, but even still, it's not like, it's not pertinent what are their sleep habits? What is somebody eating? How's their digestion? How are their relationships? What is their job like? Mm-hmm. Are they disenfranchised in their life? Are they marginalized? Do they feel like they have a locus of control or autonomy in their work? Do they have a connection to purpose and meaning? So these mm-hmm. things are determinants of our mental health, but they've been a bit, you know, they're they just pushed to the side. They're not even considered. I mean, you look at those traditional psych evaluations. I mean, there's just a little list of symptoms, but there's absolutely nothing to do with the whole person's narrative. You know, and that's what the clinical trials I do, we look at the person's narrative. It's the most important thing. You've got to, what is the, look at, look at what's going on in our country at the moment with racism. I mean, this is an, this, this is a, a, a toxic issue that is affecting the perpetrator and the perpetrator. You've got to look at the whole story. If you're treating a black indigenous person of color in your practice and you're evaluating the chemical imbalance in their brain, oh, like you've missed it. 99.9% of why somebody is showing up in your office and saying things are hard right now. So, yeah. And, and, you know, there's something about psychiatry, which I also really love, which is that it's it's extremely humbling because you never get it. You know, you never arrive. Oh, <laughs> it's love like, you're just, every time I feel like I reach like this false peak of like, okay, I have a couple really, really good patient journeys that I've been, you know, witness to. And it's like, okay, I understand how to approach this problem. And like, I kind of know how to walk with someone down that path. And then the minute I ever arrive at a place, it's like, I get it. You know? <laughs> and it's like, the, you know, you'll meet someone and it just throws it all upside down, which is great. You know, I love to yeah. be thrown upside down in these ways and to just realize there's just no dogma that holds water under all circumstances. Mm-hmm. Human mental health is infinitely complex and you kind of have to show up as a total beginner to every patient. What you've just said now is so powerful. Just say that again. I mean, that is just so powerful. You've got to literally say yeah, that. We have to show up as a beginner with every patient. And I it's think it's incredible. applicable if someone's listening and they're not, you know, a mental health practitioner, it still applies in our lives, right? Like yeah. if when we have a conversation with a friend to show up as a beginner, when we're approaching the conversations that we're having right now around racism and racial injustice to show up as a beginner. We all, I think, like really are uncomfortable being so flawed and and bad at things we feel like we should have already known. I certainly have done my fair share of being sort of working this out in practice where I'm sitting across from a patient and I feel like when I don't know what's out of balance in someone, when I don't know how to approach it, you can feel really like it's very triggering to be like, shoot, like I can't admit that I don't know. I can't like they should have been seeing a, an older, better, yeah. smarter psychiatrist, someone more inside the box, you know, and then you, you kind of wade through all the ego and all the triggers and you get back to a place of like being in alignment with intention, which is like, well, I am giving this person my meticulous attention. I'm showing up with integrity. And I think like, that's probably 
worth more than any amount of I've got it all figured out. And I think this is true in our conversations these days is like showing up with generous, deep listening and observation and a kind of comfort with the fact that I don't know. I love that. That's beautiful because that's that it kind of goes to the basic core of how one can build a relationship. And as, if, as you know from research, the most important element of helping someone, whether you're a psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever you are, is the relationship. It's not the actual techniques. It's the actual relationship that is built and how that makes the person feel. You know, so I, I love that. And, you, and taking that attitude of it's just start as though you don't know anything. Start at the beginning as though you're a beginner because that person's an individual case study. That's so good. Being that, said, I think the technique, I, I do find that more and more I'm also practicing witchcraft at the same time as sort of listening and observing and bringing a beginner's mind to my patients I've like I just it's sort of become more and more I almost do it on involuntarily like that it's almost like a Reiki or an energy work I'm doing at the same time you're sort of talking here and energetically impacting here and I had a patient I had a session yesterday and he was very constipated for about three days. And we talked about everything coming up and he had a big emotional purge in the yeah. conversation. So, you know, who knows what the real cause was, but I was also sort of like energetically just sort of like focusing on his bowels, you know, and just like yeah. doing that work. And of course I got the email like 10 minutes after the call. You'd never believe what just happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't, bring, don't bring me the evidence, please. I'll believe you. The email's good enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's amazing. But you know, you talk about the, the, the energy and that's um, a part of my work has been, I developed a theory years ago on the, on the mind because I felt that's an area that just, just like so misunderstood. And I've been trying to understand that for 30 years. So that's what a lot of people, scientists do, as you know, you start your research and you spend the rest of your life trying to understand it and basically trying to understand the mind, the non-conscious mind, the subconscious and the unconscious because there's so much confusion around that. And one of the things, just to talk about the energy, is that what I do understand now for after 38 years, well, I'm starting to understand, I should say, is that our non-conscious mind is the biggest part of us and quantum physics is a great way of understanding mind and, and energy is what we are at our most basic level and it translates into the physical cells and what we see. So that energy, when we are toxic, we're not dealing with stuff or like, this guy had a big issue coming up and our non-conscious mind knows truth uh, it's very wise our non-conscious mind is connected to wisdom it's immersed in wisdom the scientists have shown the gravitational fields that in, in quantum physics and they can be measured and they have the values of love which is so interesting and at our core so if you've got toxicity I'm just relating to this because my audience knows have heard me teach this stuff so often so I'm relating to what you've just said to help them understand the context of what you're saying so that in that energy can get blocked if you're toxic and it literally does block on an unconscious level and your mind brain connection exists so your mind and brain are separate but inseparable so that is going to then reflect in your body your body will manifest i've just done a clinical trial showing that once yet again that you're going to have whatever goes in your mind is going to affect your your body and your non-conscious and your brain are going to be reflecting that very quickly your conscious mind's a little bit slower to actually kind of wake up but your body will, ex- will express that so when you talk about we impact each other people it, when you're praying for someone, when you're laying on hands, when you are, whether you're sending good intentions, it's all the same thing. You are helping people to respond to that wisdom and release that energy. And it's a prompt from your subconscious mind into your conscious mind. And we need to listen. So you are helping him do that. So I just, there's my little five cents worth of neuroscience, mind, body science to orientate what you said. <laughs> It makes me tear up. I am I fully, I, I feel so seen in sort of my beliefs with what you just said. And yeah, oh. it's, I think about this, especially as it pertains to autoimmune disease. I think a lot about autoimmunity, another one of our current epidemics. Yeah. And I've always thought that like, it's almost like we have a little bit of an either or mindset. Like, is this starting from a, like, is this a physical, material, chemical issue, like is Roundup in our food, Mm. causing dysbiosis or an imbalance in our gut flora and causing intestinal permeability or leaky gut, which is allowing certain particles of food to get into the bloodstream and provoke the immune system and through molecular mimicry, it's attacking our own joints or whatever it is. Yes. Or is this a psycho-spiritual phenomenon? And I think actually what's really true is it's always both. And I'm not even sure there is a chicken or the egg or that it even matters. It's sort of like there's divine timing to how these things converge in our Love lives. This. Mm. And I think about with autoimmunity, I think culturally right now we have a lot of conditioning that mm. gets in the way of us experiencing a state of self-love. We've mixed up like what self-love is, that it can have a component of humility. Like we sort of think it's arrogance or being conceited and like actually like a sort of place of recognizing your own, whether it's divinity or just like that you're just a flawed human trying to do your best like anybody else and that that's mm-hmm. enough. 
like to be able to be in a state of self-love and celebrating yourself while being humble, like that's not our cultural memo. You know, we don't get that memo to be in that state of mind. And I think that that relates on some deep psychospiritual level to the fact that our immune systems attack our own tissue. Like we kind of have in the very deepest sense, like an attack on ourselves. Mm. And I think that it's an entry point, you know, for how we heal. I absolutely totally concur with what you're saying. And and it's just the most recent trials that I've done show that if you, I teach about mind management, that's kind of what I've brought it into to help mind brain for science of thought. And just seeing people in our control group who didn't get any mind management, but be, but became aware of all these issues like you've been describing, but didn't have a way of managing their mind, how they got so bad. I mean, down to the, even their telomeres in nine weeks shortening significantly, which is quite something. And obviously the cortisol, we saw significant changes in homocysteine, everything that you that has been predicted, we confirmed. But the, in the experimental group, you give someone mind management and you tell them it's okay, anxieties, we all experience that. It. It's a normal thing. Yes, there'll be cases in times where, it's mis- where it gets out of hand and it can become toxic but you can learn to manage it and just giving them the tools of managing that mind changes the energy in the non-conscious mind teaches them how to tune in and teaches them how to start becoming aware of how they can deal with all the things going on in their life that autonomy that leads to that awareness that leads to that dealing with those toxic thoughts and reducing the toxic stress and just the changes in in well-being it's unreal it's like a little little path to empowerment that we saw changing in their physiology their brain physiology neurophysiology their life and didn't mean it was all great and perfect i always talk about freaking out in the love zone you're still going to cry and, and have issues but somehow there's a level of autonomy that's come in and there's a level of being able to reduce that energy not you talk about an energy you talk about someone who impacted you some i didn't get the name of some spiritual healer who said to you that anxiety un- is unprocessed sound and you went on to unpack that so he he explained it to you and you kind of worded that as suppressed we don't deal with our issues we suppress them and that's a lot of what my work has been in my recent clinical trials show that when you suppress your thoughts it changes how your brain we can see it in in a QEEG you can see it in your your behaviors it, there's an actual there's evidence of suppression and if you don't you have to embrace it and process it and go through the pain etc etc and you were saying that kind of stuff so I was all excited and I thought gee we got to talk about this we mustn't stuff our stuff down does that do you do you recall you know it's funny I can't remember who, which energy healer this was but I, I certainly recall this and yeah. it's to me it's just part of my overall understanding of how, what makes us up like it is energetic and it is vibration and like in mental health we have this saying what we resist persists and it's like when it's something so good mm-hmm. when we're feeling when an emotion wells up like we have this sort of cultural, like we're, we're emotion phobic, you know, we don't, we, mm-hmm. if we're at work and we start to cry, we say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. If we start to cry at any point in our life, we like suck it back and we do the yeah. weird breathing thing, like, you know, and it's yeah. like, we're never letting it flow. Like we just need to let it all flow. Exactly. And it's sort of, there's a paradox here. Like everyone thinks that if they can just like push the feeling down or under a carpet, that it that it goes away, but no emotion has ever been successfully pushed under a carpet, no trauma or experience. Like it stays in there in a very energetically real way. Exactly. And it impacts our well being. It impacts in, in sort of a Chinese medicine perspective, like the flow of qi or the flow of energy around the body and, and beyond. And so I think that, like with my patients, one is I just make it very, I give people permission to let it be big. You know, even mm-hmm. in a psychiatrist's office, I'll see, I'll see patients like say sorry for crying. It's like you're saying sorry to your psychiatrist for crying. Like <laughs> you're in surround sound tissue boxes. Like I have this yeah. effect on people. This is what this is about. Let this yeah. flow. Let it Wonderful. be big. And to give people sort of like a new understanding of like, oh yeah, maybe I can let this be big and really have a good cry and let it flow. And I want my patients to do whatever practice excavates energy well for them. And that looks Mm. different for everyone. For Mm. me, I love to do a particular shaking exercise. I learned it when I studied integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, and they put on this shamanic drum music and Mm. you just shake. Mm. And you could do this for two minutes and you experience a shift. Yeah. And you feel like, I mean, what's really sacred is when like deep buried unconscious thoughts bubble up, you know, something that was sort of I think of it as like it was lodged in my hip or something. Yeah, and it's yeah. like it comes up and then I can look at it. And it's usually like a very core personal 
exquisite emotion. You know, it's not like something you can point to. It's not necessarily a memory. It's an emotion that was within me. And now I have practices for letting these things flow and you feel lighter afterward. You feel more capable of taking in the new feelings. I think we have a, an expanded capacity to feel deeply and to feel empathy when we have a really good system for metabolizing our feelings and moving through it. And so, yeah, I just want people to, mm. to lean into what they're feeling and to have some practice of shaking or dancing or journaling or painting where it's like you let what's in you, you make it manifest out in the world. You move that energy. Oh, I love that because energy cannot be lost. It can only be transferred. It's, we all know that's a basic principle. So you people, and I always tell people that I always teach on thoughts and a thought has got emotions. And I always use these images. I don't know if you've ever seen my images of the toxic tree for a toxic thought. And then I use a healthy, let me grab this healthy tree for a healthy thought. Because thought, they, the memories are built in the dendrites and the neurons and they look like trees. But, you know, just for people to recognize that a thought is such an enormous thing and it's inside of it, it's got all this information, which are memories, and the memories have got emotions. So a thought is this massive, huge tree that just never stops growing. And it's got all these, the information and emotions. And when people can start recognizing that that's going to take years to embrace and process and reconceptualize, you know, it's, so just, it's just basically saying what you're saying, just in a different way. And it's so important to get it out and to be able to transfer for that energy because if you suppress that thought it will explode volcanic mode as you said so the shaking or crying or the screaming or the tapping or the breathing those are they're such basic great basic fundamental energy releasing and then you can do more intellectual work on the on the process you know that's i love that i love what you're saying you also said like resistance is a dance against our feelings you made that comment i listened to one of your <laughs> you see you make all these great comments that i was <laughs> i think i'm always in like a trance state when i'm on a podcast <laughs> yeah. but it was just so great though but resistance is a dance against our feelings and that's so true you mean you're resisting you know you're resisting what you've got there you're kind of trying to push away from it and avoid it it just like to use like a Freudian term, like things proliferate in the dark. Like when we resist mm. and push things back, right? Like they redouble their efforts and I yes. think anxiety quite a bit these days. Anxiety falls into this parameter, this framework perfectly where when we feel anxiety coming on, the idea of strong arming it or white knuckling it, anxiety doesn't play that way. You know, mm. it really just, it sees that, that and it says, no, I will make my voice heard, <laughs> you know? And so yes. it's like only when we actually surrender and say like, okay, let me feel this. That's when it can actually sort of the wave can crest and resolve. And I think about this a lot in my practice, mm. the way I talk about it with patients is that it's like we have false anxiety and true anxiety and false anxiety is a big focus in my practice. It's mm. the sort of, and it's not to invalidate any like to, to say like your anxiety isn't real that's not the idea mm -hmm. of it you know it's probably could stand to be reframed but it's basically using julia ross's this is her thinking around false moods this comes mm -hmm. from her book the mood cure and it's basically that there are physiologic mundane events that trip our body into a stress response and that stress response can feel synonymous with anxiety, can feel like a panic attack, but it was actually just a blood sugar crash. You know, it was actually just that we're sleep deprived or we're over caffeinated or we're under caffeinated mm. or we're in interdose withdrawal between our Lexapro doses. You know, these different mm. things that can put our physiology out of balance. And then we we label that as mental illness. And so in my practice, that's the low hanging fruit. We start with all the ways that someone might be getting tripped into a false mood, into a false state of a stress response that's manifesting as anxiety. But then what remains after that is what I think of as true anxiety. And that's not something to pathologize. That's mm -hmm. not something that we should attempt to medicate away. You couldn't breathing exercise or blood sugar that away if you tried. You know, it's basically something to honor and listen to and embrace. And it's here to convey information to us I think we're uniquely in a moment in time right now where we're starting to understand that when there's like an awakening force pushing, mm. that we should actually let down the guard and listen. And listen. And listen. Because like our anxiety, you know, when, our, when we have true anxiety, that sense in our gut, that inner knowing of like mm. something's not quite mm. right here, it can be about our own personal lives, you know, is something out of alignment in the work we're doing or in a relationship or, mm. you know, whatever it may be. Or are you actually here as more of an activist? Like, are you the one who's sort of a prophet attuned to something out of balance more globally, mm -hmm. whether your mission is racial injustice or climate change or mental health being a broken system, whatever it is, or, or 
combination of everything important right now. And to basically that that anxiety is conveying a message. And when we actually let it get its message across, that anxiety is sort of like, I'm satisfied now. Thank you. I will see myself out of the room. And what you see is someone now just channeling that energy purposefully, but they're not saying, I feel anxious anymore. They're not identifying with that sort of, it doesn't feel like a like a pathology or like a symptom anymore. That is so beautifully said and so counter to the current paradigm or narrative of you symptom, 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 you have an anxiety disorder, which is like a pronouncement of giving someone cancer or something, which is what people have got in their minds. What you And I'm, I'm so glad you've explained it so eloquently and beautifully because that's also what I've been teaching for years and, and, and the process I developed is to help people to listen to those as warning signals and to even celebrate them. It's so wonderful to hear a doctor, a psychiatrist who has got all this experience who you so educated saying that same thing this is a message that we need to get to the world that you anxiety is not a disease we don't have to as Joanna Moncrief I'm sure you know who Joanna Moncrief is said we're medicalizing misery we pathologizing pain you don't need to pathologize that's not how to treat it the way to do it is to embrace it and process it and reconceptualize it and you know that's just you've just explained that so beautifully and and that's totally what I teach and totally what my, re, my most current clinical trials show that when you do that when you do exactly what you've just described you're reducing anxiety by 80, 81%. I mean, that's massive and it's never going to go away. I always tell my, when I was practicing, and but I tell everyone that I now talk to, it doesn't go away, but you learn to manage it. So it will reduce, so the toxic effect of anxiety will reduce by up to 81% just through mind management, which is awareness and reflection and the why and the processing, all that stuff. And we all can do that. And I love how you've stressed that we've got to look at, at the physiological as well as the, what could be a toxic trauma or toxic habit. So there's the two elements. So once you've eliminated the physiology, we mustn't forget that, then to deal with the the other component that could just be what's going on in your life. As you say, collective the collective global COVID-19 putting us, making us think again. People have forgotten how to think and they're seeing a lot of things about themselves that are making them anxious, which they haven't even thought about for years. So it's suppressed stuff coming up or the racism issue, which is years and years of being suppressed. It's now in our faces. We've got to get uncomfortable. And we've got to deal with it. We can't push it back down. We'll go back more toxic. We have to process through it. We can't do this dance as, as to quote you we can't we can't do this this emotional dance we have to deal with our stuff oh, I what it. i love about this it's that it actually does bring more hope than our yes. current psychiatric orthodoxy like where we're at right now and these are all stepping stones like our current orthodoxy is to basically it's the disease model it's basically saying you know this mental illness of yours is not a moral infirmity good. Glad that that's been canceled. But now we say it's a genetic chemical imbalance. You know, it's corrected by the pill. And that's great. We've sort of worked to lower the stigma around mental health. We've given some people sort of an amount of hope that like there's a fix for this. Mm -hmm. And then now we are ready to shift into the next paradigm with this because at this point there are sufficient, you know, there are millions of people who have found for one reason or another, this model didn't meet their needs. Mm. So, and this is where like the nuance and the thoughtfulness around how I address medications, this is like so important. Yes. Let's talk about that because I mean, you're an absolute expert when it comes to explaining this. In my book, I sort of open this paragraph with like strap on your seatbelt and like be patient. Like this is, this is nuanced because there's so much that is sensitive and really charged around this. I'll say like, as the caveat initially is that I'm actually not dogmatically against psychiatric medications. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate, I'm grateful to the people, the sort of other holistic psychiatrists who have been very courageous and going forward and saying like, you know, that they want to stop prescribing psychiatric medications for everyone. And, and I, that's given me bravery to kind of say, hey, that's what I'm sort of starting to sense yeah. in practice. However, as we talked about before, I've been doing this long enough to know that like any dogma I hold tightly to, it, I get kicked in the face. And it's like, I've had mm-hmm. patients who have been so helped by their psych meds. So to me, it's like, if that's what's working for you, hallelujah. You know, that's not something to question. This conversation that we're about to have is not a reason for somebody in that position to second guess themselves or to doubt it, or to think it's somehow a morally superior thing to do to get off of meds. That's not what I mean at all. I think if you've found something that works for you, consider yourself a lucky one, go forth, take your meds. And then if you are sort of the millions of people who haven't been addressed in this conversation, whose needs haven't been met, who haven't been met, whether it's that you're not helped by meds or you were initially helped by meds, but the effect faded over time, or you feel like you've 
fully been chewed up and spit out by the mental health world and you've kind of cycled through every med and every dosage and every combination and you're losing hope, you're feeling demoralized. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're helped by meds, but you experience side effects. It's sort Mm -hmm. of for all of these people where it's like, we're not giving them hope because we're not having a conversation about all the other things people can do to feel better. And it turns out there are a thousand other things we can do to feel better. And not only are there other options and other avenues to explore, but I've come to even realize that, like, as you said, like anxiety is not the disease. It's like anxiety, depression, ADHD. These are not the answer. They are a symptom. They're telling us something is out of balance here. And it can be physical. It can be mental. It can be psychospiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it can be all of these things. But basically, I feel like my job often when someone comes into my office and says, here's how I'm suffering, is to look under the hood and think like, well, where is the imbalance? Mm -hmm. Where is one of many possible imbalances? And sometimes it's not a genetic chemical imbalance at all. Sometimes it's a thyroid condition. Sometimes it's hormone imbalance or a micronutrient deficiency. Like someone could be deficient in vitamin B12 or vitamin D or magnesium. These are really common. Mm-hmm. Or someone is inflamed in their digestive tract. And so it can be all of these different actual root causes of how they're feeling. And if I were to start them on meds, like sight unseen and just say this meets criteria for clinical depression, let's start them on an SSRI antidepressant. I'm actually missing the point. I'm missing the true underlying cause in their case. And so to me, it's, it's a hasty and sometimes inaccurate or specious kind of approach. And it misses the true imbalance at the root of their mental health issues. And so I'm always going to like ask why and say like, why is this person feeling depressed? Yeah. And it might be serotonergic. That's sort of its own whole big can of worms like yeah, that's yeah. causing the imbalance in the serotonergic transmission, but it's investigative work. You're getting to the bottom of it so that you can address it in a targeted way at exactly the place of imbalance. I love that approach. And I think what's, what is interesting though, I just want to ask you a question in terms of the, the medications is what about the, as pe- people are being so, are so informed now. I've, I've watched this shift over 30 years. I've watched the shift from people working in a much more psycho-spiritual and holistic way, sort of in my own practice over 25 years to wanting more and more meds. Not, I don't, I don't prescribe obviously, but there would be, I would be getting people off meds to get their mind management going. But then swung back to a huge emphasis for the last 30 years on meds and the studies are showing that it hasn't actually improved mental health it's worse there's the side effects the, the chemical imbalance is a myth it's, it hasn't ever been proven the neurobiological correlates you know this is a huge area of very solid science showing that this is not actually a very good way of treating people and that patients are not getting told this so when they're told and I know you wouldn't do that but uh, that people are getting put on these drugs but without being told the side effects that they can actually make an informed choice so they get on them and then there's all these side effects and then they try and withdraw and you speak about this and as well with the withdrawal it's not the, a disease coming back because there was never a disease in the first place, it is the process of withdrawal that is affecting your body. And what about about telling patients about the isn't happening, about the fact that the placebo trials actually were actually more effective and, you know, and that there's a lot of bias and that's not been spoken about, but people are finding that out. Exactly. So you say the DSM is a protocol for selling pharmaceuticals. I quote, I'm quoting you there. So I've thrown a lot at you. And if you can unpack that, because this is an area of, as you know, massive controversy. People can get incredibly upset about the medications. And if, as you say, if it's helping them, because sometimes people are in such a bad place that they personally, my stand, my people that watch me know my stand is because I've done so much scientific research around this. I am really wary of the drugs because of the side effects and would rather go for the alternatives and holistic approach. But there are some people that are in a place for where they're totally psychotic and broken from such terrible trauma that they need a 48-hour help just to get through. But this long-term concept of you've got to be on this the rest of your life, there is a chemical imbalance theory. This is a lie to people. So how do we navigate that? I've thrown so much at you. I should have Can been you taking <laughs> There's like 10 million things I want to say in response. Okay, I good. guarantee you I will forget several. And I'll keep quiet. And, no, that's fine. We are, it's a big conversation, but I think it's one that needs to be had. And then if we could follow that by withdrawal, because that's a question I get so much of. So you unpack this however you want. So, so and to me, it's so important to caveat this, that there are people right now who are helped by their meds. Yes. And what we're about to talk about is like, just like we have the placebo effect, we also have the nocebo effect. And exactly. so this conversation sort of risks making you doubt the benefit you've had. So it's almost like, I want to be like earmuffs. Like if you're yes. helped by your meds, like we don't need to mess that up. I think that to me, yes, in large meta-analyses, SSRI antidepressants don't separate from placebo in mild to moderate depression. 
they do for severe depression. These meds, like placebo is nothing to sneeze at, you know, it's like, it's an effect. It's very be, real. Yeah. I would be fine with these meds if they were a benign placebo, if this was truly just a, you know, million person, you know, sort of placebo experiment, but they're not benign. There are side effects. And to me, even more damning is the difficulties people go through when getting off of the meds. Now, if you are helped by them, it's also important to say, it's not that you've been fooled. Like they don't do nothing. They do something. Mm -hmm. Do they correct, you know, genuinely correct the underlying imbalance? I don't know, but I think that what they do do is to me, they sort of narrow the range of affect. So if you're very symptomatic and just, you know, crying uncontrollably and frequently, and it's really getting in the way of your life, I think a med can narrow that. So like the lows are a little bit less low, the highs are a little bit less high and life is a little bit more narrow. And in certain situations, you could, con you could call that an improvement. And you can see how this is maybe a bridge to you starting to get into a place where you can make the diet and lifestyle changes, where you can do the work and therapy, mm -hmm. where you can change mm -hmm. your mindset. Like if that can get you into the chair and get you into that action seat, then okay, you can make a case for that. I think that what we also see is that, and I love Robert Whitaker's. Oh, he's just the best. He's brilliant. Yeah. The Mad in America, it's one of our main referrals that I give people as well on the site of as links is his work. Yeah. And his book, Native and Epidemic is someone everyone should read. Everyone should read Anatomy yeah. of an Epidemic. And mm -hmm. to me, like it's, a, it's, you should read it and there's so much to it, but a, a quick takeaway that's really important is that we are more medicated than ever. You would think yes. that we'd be better, but we're actually more disabled by mental illness. Our, our mental illnesses have more chronicity rather than less mm -hmm. with us being so medicated. And this is something I feel like I witnessed firsthand in my practice is that if, if you give me a patient who's not on meds, like to me, that's just delightful. Like we can work a few sessions, get yeah. them shifting their diet and lifestyle, shifting their mindset, and mm -hmm. they are flying out of the nest. No mm -hmm. problem. If you give me somebody on meds, it's a harder journey and it's not a journey I shy away from, but it is a harder journey. Mm -hmm. And I find that there is something in how they, they sort of like take something that was going to be self-limiting, like a state of crisis in life, and they sort of make it chronic. Mm -hmm. And so this feeds directly into withdrawal. So there's a silent epidemic right now of people mm -hmm. who decide for one reason or another to get off of their psychiatric medications. And we don't need to sort of get into the why. Like some people do it for side effects. Some people mm -hmm. do it because they don't want to be on meds. Some people are family planning. Some people are dealing with interactions with other meds, what have you. Some people just don't fill their refills, you know, like they're, yeah. whatever, you know, whatever chaos yeah, happens, can. it's a struggle, right? To be in mental health yeah. care. And that's not always working for somebody. So, mm -hmm. so basically someone's getting off of meds and we, first of all, do not have any system in place for how to support people with this process. No, We're not taught terrible. it. We're not taught it. Our education is in large part kind of marionetted by the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're not going to teach us how to get people off of meds. You know, mm -hmm. like Starbucks isn't going to train its employees how to get people to quit caffeine. Quite exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, so it's basically like we're not taught how to support patients. And there's a little bit of like the kind of party line on the street mm -hmm. is like, well, maybe do a little taper, maybe spend a couple weeks at 50% and then go off. Or like, sometimes there's a thing of like, take it every other day. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. And then really problematic is that there's a real denying and invalidation of people's struggles when they are in withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And you'll see someone say, well, SSRI withdrawal is not a thing. It's not actually like this is in your head or you're just being anxious or you're being annoying. And so patients get met with like a lot of being very resistance. dismissed mm -hmm. and resistance and no one's sort of stepping in to support them on the process. Can I interrupt you for one second there? This is where it's quite scary that the, the medical profession, specifically psychiatry, is not keeping up to date with the latest research because if they did, they would even see that WHO has issued a statement saying that they, it's absolutely confirmed that they, you know, they've changed. The NIC guidelines have changed as well, NICE guidelines, that there are side effects of coming off withdrawal effects of coming off antidepressants. So, you know, they, it's a matter of doctors also keeping up to date with what is happening. Sorry, I just wanted to insert that. Yeah, so this is so important. And as we know, like these things always, there's such a lag in terms of how they're adopted down the many Downstreams. Where you find yeah. somebody in their like dusty private practice and are they validating a patient's experience? You know, yeah. are they staying current? And to me, what, what ends up happening a lot of times is someone goes off their psychiatric medication and then what their psychiatrist or their primary care doctor, whoever's prescribing it, says to them when they get symptomatic is mm -hmm. this is relapse. 
And so this is an indication to go back on the medication. Mm -hmm. This shows us, wow, you really were depressed. You really still are depressed. You really needed this medication. It was really helping you. That is a, it's quite a distortion. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say mm -hmm. there's no such thing as relapse of depression. There truly is. Mm -hmm. But there's a trump card here. You cannot diagnose relapse when you're in the context of acute withdrawal. Mm. That is going to eclipse any potential for relapse because mm. you are in a much more sort of like prominent state when you're mm. in acute withdrawal. And so when patients are getting off of psychiatric medications, to me, I just want them to realize they are in withdrawal. Mm -hmm. They might feel very symptomatic. People feel anxious, irritable. They have insomnia. They have crying spells. They don't feel like themselves. I hate to say it, but very frequently people have suicidal thoughts. Yes. I think it's just so important for people to recognize mm. this is not me. This is not relapse. Mm. This is not I'm broken and it's hopeless. This is withdrawal from a mood altering, a mind altering medication. Mm. And the more we can sort of, once we understand that, we can work with that then we can mitigate the withdrawal experience. It's usually in doing a dramatically more gradual taper than what doctors typically mm -hmm. recommend. It's not a two week, 50% reduction. It's no. sometimes a six month or a year long process to yeah. go gradually, which I also don't want to make people feel hopeless with that. Cause it's not like, oh God, this is going to be a year before I'm off meds. You're, you're effectively off meds at some point, you know, along that process. Yeah. And those last several months is really just helping your brain kind of rebuild receptors Mm -hmm. restructure synapses. It's just keeping you out of withdrawal. It's not making you feel particularly medical. No, that's such a good way of saying it because it makes it a little bit more accessible. It doesn't make it so scary. It does take time. And the, but whereas if they dramatically, if they cut, as you say, the 50% or take half or every alternate day, that's too much of a shock for the system. So I know these things like tapering strips. And so can you talk now about, you handled that really well, by the way, that was excellent, excellent answer. Because I know it's a very, it's a very touchy subject. In my encouragement, if I just may wrap up around your, your answer there is to encourage people to get informed, get knowledge, get you know, read up, find out. They are great. Like Robert Whitaker's book explains a lot of the truth about those studies and will give, and it's in accessible language. So you don't have to read complex studies to work out, is there a scientific bias in the study, which is very complicated to see if you don't know what you're looking for. But they are great books. And Madden America has lots of blogs and things for people to be able to go and understand this. And you have information on your site. I mean, there's quite a few places where people can. So I really encourage people to get informed and make your decision based on facts, not opinion, not on feelings, but on facts. With withdrawal, how do people do that? And obviously it's under medical care, you, you know, you'll guide people through that. But things like tapering strips and what does it mean if you shouldn't take, you know, cut down by half or skip a day, why, et cetera, et cetera. If you could give us some steps and guidelines. So the way I think about it, it's, I'm just going to like use an analogy and then give the sort of the steps. I think Perfect. about it very similar to in cardiology. If someone has blockages, like sort of stenotic blockages or like, you know, plaque building up in the walls mm -hmm. of their coronary arteries, that's what's building slowly towards having a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And if that's developing gradually, so if that develops precipitously, if you just have a clot that goes to a coronary artery and occludes it, that's a heart attack. Mm -hmm. If you, if they are developing gradually, if that plaque is developing gradually, your body actually has a chance to build what I think is called collaborative circulation. So it's almost mm -hmm. like your body starts to build new blood vessels that go mm -hmm. around the plaque. So, mm -hmm. and it basically your body knows like, this is risky. Brilliant. Yeah. Let's have a, you know, plan B. I think it's very similar with medication discontinuation is that you want to go gradually so that your brain starts building almost the equivalent of collaborative circulation. It's not blood vessels mm -hmm. in the brain, but it's, there's a lot that happens Networks. in terms of, mm -hmm. yeah, it's downregulation and upregulation mm -hmm. of receptors, yeah. building neurotransmitters. And that just takes time and raw materials. Mm -hmm. You need good nutrition. You need rest. Yeah. You need like all of this time for your body to do that kind of housekeeping mm -hmm. work. And so the more gradually you go, the, I find the less symptomatic the taper can be. So what I'll usually do if someone's on like a straightforward taper, like they're on a hundred milligrams of Zoloft, and this isn't exactly medical advice because this is truly something to be working closely with a practitioner yeah. who supports yeah. this because this is, it's a, it's a unique and different and sometimes very challenging journey for everybody. Yes. But I usually go down by about 10% of the original dose per month for the first several months. So if they were on 100 milligrams of Zoloft, we would go down to 90 and then to 80 and 70 and 60 and 50. Working with a compounding pharmacy, 
So someplace that will actually build them build it for a them. capsule that's exactly 80 milligrams of Zoloft, which is not something commercially available. Mm-hmm. We keep it more affordable by every time we get to a commercially available dose, like you get to 50 milligrams of Zoloft, you say compounding pharmacy, we'll see you in a couple of months. You go over to your local pharmacy and you get the commercially available dose mm-hmm. more, it's less expensive. And then once you get to the end of the taper, 10% of the original dose, 10 milligrams, becomes too big of a jump. So then it's more like you you play around with it, nothing set in stone, but you mm. basically go as fast or as slowly as the body seems to be indicating is the right speed. Mm. And you know, you're balancing like you want to get to the end of this taper with the fact that you want to go gradually and gently. And people usually really know for themselves by that point, like what's the right pace. And we usually make an adjustment about once per month and I support the taper. And this is the part that sometimes... Mm, I was going to ask you, so how, how do you support it? Because I know you're big on that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very robust diet and lifestyle approach to giving your body all the conditions it needs to successfully rebuild and emerge from this like very sustainably well. So it's something that resembles like a Whole30 diet or a real food or paleo diet. Mm-hmm. There's lots and lots of individual variability around that, yes. but more or less real food, avoiding fake food, lots like really prioritizing sleep, prioritizing movement, prioritizing meditation. We throw away, you know, throw around the recommendation to meditate, like, you know, it falls on dead ears. Yeah, I know. I know. It's because everyone's saying it. Yeah. But when you're actually pulling a medication, it's, well, it's in a very yeah. cut and dry way. Like when you're, when you're pulling a medication off, you're kind of pulling out the rug from underneath you Yeah, and it puts your, your nervous system in a stress response. And then what you really want to do is combat that by very targeted action to put your nervous system into a relaxation response. So breath work or meditation or yoga nidra or whatever works for you, something that you know puts you in that ah feeling at the end of Shavasana, that relaxation yes. response, it just helps balance your nervous system so that yeah. you can be at a comfortable baseline. Mm-hmm. And then I will have people do certain supplements and certain detoxification supports, basically just to kind of like, it's a leg up to make the process go a little more smoothly. That's excellent. So, and then you also you bring in the you do the exercise as well. So it's all. So it's not just it's not just one thing. You're not just taking them off a drug. You're addressing the whole line, and at the same time, you're also dealing with the emotional stuff. You're helping them to process that in the first place. So there's a holistic approach, and that is very unusual in this day and age for a psychiatrist to be doing because most of it's just diagnose symptom medication. You taking the time to spend, this is a lot of time you're spending with a patient in a withdrawal process, in that whole lifestyle change in terms of diet, exercise, the yoga, the meditation, the whatever they, you also do acupuncture. Yeah. This is amazing. I mean, these are, and then Chinese medicine, you, so you've bought in everything and you offer that whole combination to your, to your patient. Yeah. And the, the idea of like time I mean, time is the commodity that's been squeezed out of the medical interaction yes. now, you know, yes. like now that it's, it, we basically are down to like 15 minutes or eight minutes with a patient and oh, sort gosh. of the opposite of how you get good results in this care. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I spend two hours in my initial oh, wow. consultation with a patient, but that gets very wow. expensive and inaccessible. So I also now just do online groups and make it donation based and just scale and make this available wow. broadly. I think of it very much with an analogy of childbirth as your, how do you hold space for someone getting off of a medication? And there's sort of that obstetric, and I don't mean to sort of like just, you know, it's, it's broad strokes about obstetrics, but a kind of a reactive stance to something is challenging in labor and it's very reactive. You need an epidural. We need to go to C-section. You know, it's very like, oh no, you know, let's react and cut and do some very young or active intervention. Yeah. And the midwifery approach is much more like you're knitting in the corner and every once in a while you're like, you got this mama, you know, or you're like yeah, massaging yeah. your back. And it's kind yeah. of like not so fear-based or so reactive. It's basically like, yeah, this is a journey that you're on. Mm. This is your sacred journey. I am here to tell you, to reflect back to you, you can do this. It's difficult, but you can do this. And it's basically much more of a supportive role. And to me, it's very important that I take a stance where if someone is freaking out in their taper, Mm -hmm. I'm not freaking out. You know, I don't jump to a reactive or fear-based place with that. Mm. I've luckily enough have done this enough times with patients that I'm not afraid Mm. that I see how strong people are, how, you know, they can come back to purpose and intention and get through challenges. But I think that when you come to your psychiatrist and you say, I'm getting off these meds and I'm having dark thoughts, a lot of psychiatrists really jump to a kind of medical, legal, protective stance. And they say, you got to go to the hospital. And to be Mm -hmm. honest, it's sort of like, it just 
spirals. Yeah, it spirals out of control. Mm. And then somebody says, oh God, I'm, I'm even sicker than I realized. Like I really just needed to talk mm. about these dark thoughts that are often sort of yeah. ego dystonic. They don't feel like this is really, there's not intent. There's not like, this is what I want. It's more like it's scary and uncomfortable to have these thoughts come into my mind. Mm. I want to talk about that with somebody who understands, who listens. And so often that's what what people need. It's like, we don't need a hospitalization. We need a one hour conversation. Mm -hmm. We need to get you back to seeing that there is reason for hope to recognizing that these thoughts mm -hmm. are external, that they're the withdrawal, that they're not you. This isn't what you want. And I think that mm -hmm. that's, that's the work and it can be very touchy, but it's like, this is, you know, there's a silent epidemic right now. There's a lot of people struggling with this at home, alone, ashamed, thinking it's just me, thinking it doesn't apply mm -hmm. to other people. And I'm hopeful that we'll increasingly have a public conversation about the journey of getting off of psych meds and that mm -hmm. that is, in fact, very universally difficult. Gosh, what you've said is just so powerful and so important. You know, we need we need respite homes like they have in certain periods of history where they've had places that are beautiful where people can go and just immerse themselves for a time without being forcefully where the police are the first responders and the person is literally treated like a criminal criminal and removed from their loved ones and taken away and the fear around that and locked up and forced medication and chopped there is this terrible, scary and then that follows you the rest of your life. It's just terrible. We need that place where you're feeling broken. Just what you've described everything if we can get it one-on-one -on -one, if we can change our medical system to be able to supply this kind of intervention and to get communities more involved and then to have homes some people just need to take some time out of life and just go and to a place where it's beautiful and safe and they can paint and they can talk and they can do what you've just described you know that's part of what I'm trying to do with the work that I'm doing and you and I need to talk about this more because we we need it we've got to I know it's Robert's dream it's been Soteria Robert Whitaker Soteria House there's been a few projects around that have been so successful and the people have really gone through the, the, the description that you've described now in, in that kind of setting and it's worked, but they've been shut down by the pharmaceutical companies because they, they there's no money in them because they're not taking drugs. They get them off drugs and they get become fit back into society. So, you know, it becomes up to people like ourselves to educate people and to get the initiatives going where we can, from a grassroots level, rebuild the respite home concept. And, and I know there's a few like Dr. Peter Kinderman in the UK is pushing for this. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are now, but we they, but there's a lot of talk. We need to actually have action put into into place. So people like yourself that are already offering, like you said, group training, that you, you're doing group sessions because of the affordability. I mean, that's just, thank you. That's just absolutely amazing. I've created an app. I mean, we're all doing what we can. And the more we collaborate, the more we can actually do for people. And you also mentioned just about the whole, I just wanted to emphasize for my viewers, I talk a lot about neuroplasticity and what you described with the withdrawal process. So incredibly beautifully, by the way, thank you so much, the way you described the whole concept and how to do it. It's neuroplasticity, your brain changes whatever you put in. So epigenetically, whatever you put in your mouth, eat, think, it changes your brain. So obviously it takes time for your brain to change back. And what's so interesting, which I've always told people with when it comes to withdrawal and change is it's more difficult to withdraw from the modern American diet, which I know you know, than it is from cocaine. And if the, you look at the list of addictions, psychotropics are number four. So if you can get off the sodas and the modern American diet, you can get off psychotropics because it's like modern American diet's number one and, and number four is your psychotropic. Cocaine is number seven. So it's just interesting to give people a perspective that this is, this can be done, but we need more people like yourself. We need you educating the other psychiatrists and doctors on doing this are you so there's my next question i say all this to say that then that's the changes that we are experiencing with the drugs is neuroplastic the changes with you coming off is neuroplastic and that's why it takes time it's the change of the change of the brain so to pivot now to the doctor question are you training other physicians are other psychiatrists are the medical world are they listening to you i know i'm training a lot are they listening to you are they hearing you and are they changing and is there a desire they are now. Yeah. So I think that for the longest time, like certainly in, in residency, when I was giving like grand rounds presentations on this, like nobody was receptive to it at that time. It was like, that's yeah. nice. That's nice. Oh, <laughs> gosh, yeah. But I also was younger and hadn't, you know, there wasn't proof of concept in my practice. Mm, it wasn't established. Mm. So I get it. Then I worked for a long time in a large primary care group and I sort of went up at the podium and gave a lot of talks on, on these ideas. And you know, like the most outlier open-minded among them were sort of receptive to it. But overall, it was like, this is too weird. I've now gotten to the point where some people come forward and they say, Alan, it's really weird. But like that stuff you were saying 10 years ago, now it's coming true. 
Oh gosh. <laughs> it's like, Coming true. It's been true. <laughs> so it's like now that the New York Times has caught up, you know, yeah. like now it's now it's true. So yeah. but I yeah, New York found, Times needed to confirm the truth of it, gosh. <laughs> so I have found that and I understand they have a responsibility yeah, to be sort yeah. of like airtight in what they put forth. So that just means yeah. that they're 10 years late to the game. Yes, which is always the case, 10 to 20 years before things are really applied from a scientific perspective into practice. But it probably means they're also not promoting some things that are a little bit not valid. So yes. good for them. But I think that in terms of training practitioners, so now that I do these groups pretty regularly, like every month I have a new online group, I'm seeing that increasingly, and I haven't like put it out as this is a practitioner training. I think at some point I will do one that's specifically for that. But it's just been like now 50% of my group participants are practitioners who want to learn amazing. this approach. So it's so exciting. And you see in this group, it's like extra magical because this is the community element and people are supporting each other and we're all learning and you see you're not alone and being a seeker and sort of wanting to expand your understanding of what is mental health about. But you see, like it gives all of us more hope to see this tidal wave of practitioners who are saying, I'm not satisfied with the model I was taught and I I suspect there's a better way. And so I am seeing a tidal wave now and it gives me hope. You know, everything, like everything about 2020 is... Yeah. Like, whoa, we are in... Wake up call. We're in the moment. We're in the moment. We have such great opportunity to change. It's, it's amazing. I'm there's so reason for hope. Yeah. yeah, there's reason for hope. And I'm so glad they, that physicians are listening to you. I find when I do my... Because I do also do a lot of seminars and conferences and things. And we have so many doctors now that are learning and training and changing their mind and being approached on all different levels. So I've seen a definite shift in the last probably five years, but especially the last three years. There's been a definite shift to this is not working. We have to have another. And your special primary care physician who very often, as we know, the first port of call that a person, I'm feeling depressed and generally it's just a prescription is given because there's no training. I mean, you know, you've been through medical training. You wouldn't get trained, even as a psychiatrist, how much mind training did you get? If you think of it, isn't that crazy? None. Yeah. Like exactly. None. Like and CBT, the, but apart that, no. And even CBT is formulaic. You know, that's like when I talk about CBT, the five-step protocol that I've developed, it's the it's one of the things you could do in the first step, only when you've done the actual human stuff, you know, the psycho-spiritual stuff, all the other stuff, the addressed all the other elements. But doctors are definitely becoming more aware. But around doctors, one physician a day is committing suicide. They're under so much stress and physical burnout and mental burnout. And we know the statistics, the medical, not just doctors, the medical profession in general. But I've seen from my just my discussions with doctors, and this is where I want to go with a question, there's this thing that, oh, I can't admit that I am battling with emotional issues myself because then I'm not going to be seen as a valid physician or I've got to have it all together. You opened this discussion by saying you battle. Now, you are highly qualified, not just in one degree. You have multiple degrees, English major, which I think opened your mind to a lot of stuff, being an English major, medicine, psychiatry. I mean, you, it's Chinese medicine, acupuncture, functional medicine. You've really, and your first statement to me was, to all of us, was you battling. And that's what we've got to, because what, what, and I've been approached by physicians, it's like they don't know how to manage their own mental health, let alone help their patients with mental health. And so there's this disconnect, but then they've got to act like I've got the white jacket on, I'm superior, I know everything God complex, I've got, but I can't live into the God complex. That's a major issue. And if we give our physicians permission to feel the emotions, we can then relate. That makes you so relatable. What do you think about that? What is your... In a way, like, it's crazy that we think that it would be somehow something that detracts. Like, to me, it's the most Im important credential, right? Is like, I actually, I really struggle to treat patients of anything that I feel like I haven't experienced in some degree myself. Because it's like, what do I really have uniquely to offer here? When I've been mm -hmm. in it, like when I've been inside of a condition, like I feel like I know my way around. I know the pain points. I know how to speak in a language that people say, you get me, like you understand this. So I think like it's rather than something that should be shameful or somehow invalidates our capacity to help it. I think it really is the asset. It's the credential. Mm -hmm. And I look at doctors and I think, I mean, I have a lot of strong thoughts about this. We could go down a fairly radical tributary about the fact that I think doctors are also very medicated and I do find this is controversial, this is delicate, but I worry that the more medicated we are as a culture, 
there's something that psych meds seem to do for some people, which is that in the on-ramping and the off-ramping, like when you're starting a med and mm-hmm. when you're getting off of a med, which is might be you're tapering or you missed a dose mm-hmm. or you changed your dose for whatever reason, you're yeah. switching meds. In those transition phases, I see a significant uptick in suicidal thoughts mm-hmm. alongside occasionally this very kind of lethal combination of being a little dissociated, things feeling a little surreal, and things feeling a little bit numb and a little impulsive. That combination is incredibly dangerous. So I worry sometimes that the fact that you know mm-hmm. we're more medicated makes us more at risk of more suicide. And I look at doctors and doctors can prescribe for themselves, can prescribe for their friends, like are just plugged in or sort of like, you know, psychiatrists. I just feel like they're on so many psych meds, mm-hmm. you know, because they're just like, that's their world. You know, I think like dermatologists get a lot of Botox and psych meds are on a lot of clonopin, you know, and it's exactly. like, if you're surrounded by it. And, and I think that it makes doctors very fragile. And I also know, and I identify with this firsthand is that you go into medicine, you don't go into medicine for the wrong reasons. You know, that's, no, it's no, too many it's hoops. Too much of a commitment. Yeah. Too much of a commitment. It's not a pretty journey. It's not an easy journey. There's nothing about it. That's like, this is no. an easy ticket for an awesome life. You know, it's, no. it's never like that. You go in for the right reasons. And then over the course of the nine or 10 years that you're in training, you're sort of systematically, you shift to it, you arrive at a slightly different place. Some people, and like, I know my colleagues, they are smart, hardworking, their yeah. intentions are good. Yes. Some people find a pocket to practice in a way that's their passion. They are practicing in alignment with their beliefs and they're out there like Mother Teresa Ng and just like doing God's mm-hmm. work and thank goodness for those folks. And then a lot of people find themselves making a series of decisions because they're in a lot of debt or because they're burned out and they just need a good lifestyle or whatever it is. People make a lot of decisions where they end up practicing in a way that's not perfectly in alignment with their truth, with their values. Mm. And I think that's a very toxic way of living our lives. And I think about that like... There were little pockets of my career where I was like entertaining those kinds of jobs. And I sort of did the imaginary exercise of picturing myself showing up, like waking up in the morning and going to work and doing that work. And it would have crushed my soul. And, and I think that, you know, there is a way of, I, I, to me, that puts people at risk of suicide is like feeling locked in and that there's no path out. And you just feel like, what am I doing to the world? Am I a force for good Mm. or not? Wow, you said that so well. So this is something that has to be addressed. I think we should have another discussion just completely around that. And we didn't even touch on the sleep. And I mean, this is like you and I could, like in the beginning, we said we could talk all day. I want to make one comment about the withdrawal and the Lexapro and the doctors. In my most recent clinical trial, one of our subjects was who's in the in experimental was on Lexapro and had tried everything. Nothing was working and depression, like really severe and just everything, like not sleeping, the whole everything. And who, one of her things is, first of all, we put on the mind management and she went through the cycle of 63 days, which is the whole neuroplasticity research I've done. And it, honestly, her, the QEEG, the behavioral, the physiology, the narrative, everything dramatic changed, dramatic. She got it under control. She was managing the depression, lifted to a point where she was managing, which is amazing. And it was sustained at 63, sustained at six months. So it's really a radical change. The point I want to make in relation to that is mind management works when you get, which is what you've been saying. So there's evidence of everything you're saying. I'm seeing this in my clinical trials because it's a very holistic approach too. But also the, the interesting because I know you talk about Lexapro, you sp- I've heard you speak about that in terms of withdrawal. She was on Lexapro was was coming off it. One of the things that we know with Lexapro and any anti de- an antidepressant is your awareness of the ability to have insight is not very good. And that was with her initial intake. She wasn't even she could describe in her narrative how she was, but when you when she filled in the traditional because we had different we, traditional psychiatric protocols at scales that she'd seen before, it was almost like she wasn't depressed. And then her insight, the scale that I developed that really looks at insight and what's really going on in your nut conscious there, we could see how depressed she actually was. So she was living in cognitive dissonance. And a lot of that had actually affected, and as she, she actually, as, as she got more mind management, that became her awareness increase, so her empowerment increased. So I'm relating this back to doctors. I mean, there's a whole conversation around this, but relating back to doctors who are on things like Lexapro, awareness, insight is lacking. We saw energy changes in the brain where your ability to actually integrate information from different areas of the brain, which is not multitasking, it is actually a natural internal function, is not operating like it should. So this leads to compassion fatigue and physician burn. This is very real. So it's not helping, it's making it worse. And it also does something weird with the D- the DNA, the telomeres. Initially it ups them and then it decreases them. So there's so much 
cellular health that's being affected too. And so this is something that needs to be addressed and educa education for the medical profession, not just the public. So that's just a Here's where my brain <laughs> fires too when you say this. I so resonate with this. And I think that, you know, I think about when we're on oral contraceptives and we're trying to choose our mate for life. And yeah. it's like, it actually impacts our ability. You're, you're really trying to smell on almost a pheromonal level yeah. who is compatible with us. It has to do with how different our immune systems are, you know? And I think that yeah. when that's impacted, we might make different and perhaps worse choices about who we're compatible with because there's a barrier to that our ability to sense in that way. And I, I think mm -hmm. about it, I'll admit this, this is sort of shameful for me, but I don't know. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I want to sort of scratch mm -hmm. that word, but it's like, this is this is something I don't admit pub publicly typically is that the couple months before my wedding, I got Botox for the first and only time in my life. And yeah, that's and, okay. It's a wedding. You like to do these things. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but I was still a psychiatrist and I noticed that I would sit across from a patient and I realized so much of my insight and my capacity for empathy and really understanding what someone was going through came from mirror neurons and mirror yes, neurons. Yes, of course. They're in relationship to your facial muscles because your you're, you're mirroring. And I was almost missing some data because my face could wow. not and wasn't mirroring. I was like sitting there like, that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it impacted wow. my insight. And I think that so many of doctors, when we're really, when we're actually wow. able to be healers, not just technicians, not healers. just providers, healers. Mm -hmm. but healers, there's so much witchcraft happening under the surface. Wow. And we want all of our cylinders firing. You know, we want all yeah. of our capacity for picking up and observing and sensing and listening and feeling. And I think that I don't mean to say like, if you're on Lexapro that you're not healing, you know, certainly I've had so many of my patients who yeah. couldn't get out of bed and then are on Lexapro and they're thriving in their life. So yeah. it's not all, you know, there's just yeah. nothing hundred percent about this, but I have had patients have who've gotten off mm -hmm. of meds who have felt like I am now for the first time feeling like myself, mm -hmm. feeling more deeply, feeling mm -hmm. more in general. And I think that, you know, for us to, to show up as, as healers, I do think it is helpful for us to be like really with a big antenna. That is such a great example of just, uh, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that because it kind of wraps that up. And, and I'm glad you just, you know, we, we've, sometimes we just need, you mentioned one of your patients that I think was, didn't want to initially come off Lexapro and then four years later, once they had worked through or whenever it was or four months or something, they did. And that's the thing, maybe because it is suppressing the emotions, but maybe they needed that hiatus. And then, but then they've got to be prepared to go through the door because it is going to change the brain and the body. So there's a whole, but so there's so much and so much complexity and so much to see the person as an individual case study. Okay, we'll have to stop here. We'll never stop talking, but this is just the beginning. Thank you for your insight, your wisdom, your work, your contribution. It's just phenomenal. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Caroline, thank you so much.